about Ghana Card and how to get rid of uh, elements that want to deceive and want to cheat in our country and get a clean system, let me quickly share with you a couple of the messages sent in uh, by our viewers and listeners. Papa Ansa uh, from Latte Equapim says, I've been advocating for the use of solar in all these health facilities, schools, universities, um, parliament, and also government facilities in Ghana. Government should make it a duty free, uh, duty free on solar panels and even on their batteries. So it will ease the pressure on ECG. ECG is always telling lies. Hmm. Nana is sending this from, says, Peace Land. Where is that? Why is Richard Ahiagba always on the attacking and politicking any time he's to answer a question? All that we are saying is, don't tell me the issue. Solve the problem, period. How are we taking away politics in our uh, issues? When all leading our institutions are from a ruling party, please, let's stop deceiving ourselves. Please, fix the situation because... You have the man. Stephen in Tema says, the NPP man is so unfair to us Ghanaians. What do they take us for? They should wait for December. So disheartening uh, a government we voted into power. Nene Koda sends in this one. Um, he says, can ECG be sued because I have paid for power and I'm not getting it? Mm. You can explore, see how that works. Uh, Sape Agbo says, Richard Ahiagba is being economical with the truth. The under-recovery of cost of generation has always been a challenge. It's not only limited to the NPP. Past governments had experienced the same challenge, yet NPP was loudly shouting and accused JM as the one who invested um, in Dumso. It was the challenge of the recovery of costs that informed the NDC government's decision to establish the energy sector recovery levy. The MPP came to power and mortgaged the funds that had accrued in the energy sector recovery levy. And finally, Hattie Anafo says all MPP needs is money to buy gas, but they can't generate money, even after selling energy domestic and foreign. One problem, buy gas and they can't fix that, all right? Thanks for your messages. And as you may have heard, the MP Dominic Ayene, uh, in that clip, he said he was all struck to see what Ghana Card was doing, those in charge of it were doing. And they have found 45,000 passports, which we can call fake, they have found another 45,000 driver's licenses, which, you know, can be used to do all sorts of wrong in the society. As many as 130,000 NHIS cards, which also do not exist on the database. There's also a number of SNAID cards, about 166,000. And this is what is bringing this topic back for discussion as they met with Parliament to speak about their problems and what needs doing immediately. Of course, you also have followed Dr. Baumia uh, launching the Ghana car for Abeth. What exactly will it do? As of the 15th of February, 2024, they have registered so many Ghanaians. I won't let the wind out of the seals of the um, MD of the margins group, those who are in charge of this business. Now, in the studio is Moses Baden, group CEO of margins group. Dr. Nana Asne is lecturer, School of Technology and Social Sciences, Gimpa, and will be joined by Desmond Israel, a lawyer and information security data privacy practitioner in the USA. Also does uh, security surveillance among others. 
Thank you very much for making time to join us, sir. Thank you. Thank right. You so let's begin. For those of us who have not actually followed the Ghana card story, why should we believe these MPs, these politicians, who never agree, but for once are agreeing and saying Ghana card is what will give us a clean society? First of all, what does that mean, that it will give us a clean society? Well, I think that the, the visits by the MPs uh, on both sides of the subsidiary legislation committee and defense and interior was an eye-opener because most of the comments made up in the media on Ghana card, I think is merely born out of ignorance because people don't understand the, the concept of it. And as was articulated by, by both sides of the, of the house, it was also being politicized sometimes, seeing in the political lens that it is for voting. But the Ghana card essentially is not just a card, it's a whole system, mm. a national ID system, and we're able to demonstrate that to them. This system is made up of infrastructure and platforms that are in 18 different segments with leading different kinds of subject experts to run it. And this is integrated into what is the national ID system. Mm. The card is only one part of the 18. Right? Now, in order to produce such a card, you need to have very high certifications. And our subsidiary intelligent cards production systems is the most certified factory in the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa, mm. with more than eight top-level international certifications. OK. You, you take us through, because I understand from my production side that you're going to run us through a few uh, slides to give us a better appreciation of it as background before we begin to ask you a couple of questions. But how many have we captured on the system so far, and how many cards are out? Because that has been a tony issue. When we've captured in excess of 17.8 million of the population above 15, which constitutes about 85 percent of the population. How many of them have cards? The cards that have been, well, cards printed is 17.7 million plus. And cars delivered is short of 640,000 that people are yet to collect. Okay. Yes. Right. So help us to understand you. So we'll ask you a number of questions. People have sent in some of them. Okay. I mean, you know the Margins Group will be 34 years on 13 December. And we are incorporated in 1990. Uh, we started as a uh, print furnishing business and a lamination business. In 95, we changed our focus to identity. And since 95, we introduced laminated IDs, moving from past books with pictures and so on. And we've evolved it to what you see today. So that evolution involves going from laminated ID cards to the latest uh, Ghana card. Whilst ID used to be a fiduciary thing, basically looking at the security of a physical document, today it's also digital, and we combine both. So our vision is to connect identities used broadly of both people and things, securely to transactions and solutions and products. And the Ghana card is only one of that. So since 1990, our products have been in the pockets of every Ghanaian, whether they know it or not. And we've produced identity systems from the fiduciary old world to the digital world for banks, for government institutions, for corporates and so on for 34 years. And we've done every, every event in Ghana, that, you know, from non aligned movement to the sports events, we produce all the IDs, both the IT and the fiscal documents. And we produce Ghana passports and laminates since the 90s. And today we organize at the Margins ID Group level, we have a first class certified factory, as I said, manufacturing secure documents, mm. which can manufacture more than 20 million secure documents a year. And then we have a technology company that builds software and infrastructure that connects these documents to transactions for third parties securely. So that's our 34 year journey. And we, we didn't arrive here just by chance, you know, it's a long process mm. and we have uh, lasted this. The, the Ghana card is only the, the latest manifestation of what we do. We understand that what you're doing as those of us who have participated in appreciate 
we simply are coming to a single source of identification. What exactly is that and what's the benefit in that? Okay, you know, identity is, um, is a legal question and then it's a technical question, you know. So the legal identity of a person is determined by foundational law. In the case of Ghana, citizenship is determined by our constitutions, our various constitutions since independence and prior to independence, the, the fundamental law. And that fundamental law dictates that if your parents or your grandparents is Ghanaian, then you're a Ghanaian citizen. Ours is not citizenship by, by where you are born. It's by blood, you know. So even though citizenship is a, question, is a fact, it's also a question of law. So how do you evidence that citizenship? Now, the situation before the Nagalan Car Project started as far back as 2003, when uh, President Kufo started this uh, organizing um, the Ghana Card Project and the importance of having this clean society was to find that single source of truth that will establish once and for all. Single source of, of truth. truth. Which will establish legally through a process that you are who you claim you are. And then take that relevant data from you and create a fiscal document that you could then use to identify yourself while going through transactions in order to remove fake identities, which is really the foundation for all crime. So that's the first principle. Mm. But how you do that technically is that different countries are at different stages of um, identity than the infrastructure. If you take Northern Europe, for instance, because their records are well kept, they have birth certificates that you can rely on. They have an addressing system that you can rely on. They have school records, medical records, and so on, that these identities are tied to through your life cycle. So they are able to, for instance, adopt what you call a federated identity system, which means that they don't need to create a database from scratch. Using these existing databases, they can consolidate what you call a federated identity system in order to create a unique identity. But it comes to the situation in Ghana, because our records were truncated, you cannot really say whether these silo federated identities mm. can be relied on. So recognizing this problem, all governments over the five presidents that I have seen, and I know each of them personally, <laughs> have noticed that in order to be able to deliver services to citizens efficiently, you need to know who your citizens are and where they are living. But if I go to any of the silo databases, like a passport office, and I give them the information that I'm Samson Ladi, and they give me a passport saying Samson Ladi, even if they take my biometrics, it connects to me, but my ident legal identity is wrong. Mm. Then if these databases are not connected, I'm able to go to SNIT and say I'm Moses Baden with the same identity, same biometrics. But this time, I'm 24 because I want to increase my pension age. And then I can play for the stylist because I'm 17. So you can imagine that over the years, we've created these silos that have identities that are not reliable and that have duplicates if you put the silos together. So a clean and powered society should have a process where you can collect legal identity through a verified legal process and then create a database that has all the fields that public sector and private sector entities use to do their work in establishing identity and then connect that with biometrics so that you can now harmonize this data, foundational database with these silo databases and remove the duplicates so that we have a clean society where people are who they claim they are. Once you achieve that clean society and database, you're able to then have effective planning and budgeting precisely. You know exactly where all your farmers are, you know exactly where all your school children are, what ages they are. So the school feeding program by just for instance will not be bloated. Now, you know how to save money. Instead of government procuring several parts of this 18 segmented subsystem that I've told about. Government, for instance, buys data capture equipment for passports, buys transmission equipment, buys biometric systems, and that's same for SNIT, that's same for all the other silos, DVL and so on. Mm. If you calculate the cost, and this is empirical, we've done the research over 10 years, government spends 
$1.5 billion on these silo databases. So imagine removing all the silo databases and building one foundational database that feeds the silos in real time with real time, relevant, up to date modern technology. Then you eliminate the 1.5 billion. And if you today go to DVLA, for instance, and you want to register your car, they don't have to ask your name. I'm saying today, I'm not right. saying maybe. Mm -hmm. All you need to do is to give them your national ID number. They can do a one to one verification. Your data goes from NIA to DVLA in under a second and populates their data enrollment system. Then they add the vehicle centric data. So you, you can't have a false name tied to a false uh, mm. vehicle. Mm. It's automatic. It's being fed by NI. DVLA does not need to buy all these expensive segments. And so it goes for all the other institutions that sell databases. So you are, will be who you claim you are. And corruption will be reduced because when people do the transactions, we know that they're who they are. If I buy 10 cars, GRE knows that I bought a million dollars worth of cars. And my tax is only $100. It can't be. You know, it provides the basis for people being honest and clean and objective. And it provides the basis for a data-driven decision-making process for the whole society, both public and private. Okay. So now hold it on there for us. Um, I want to bring, in, bring you in here briefly. When you first read the news, and all of this happened within this week. Dr. Baumia says, now football age is over. <laughs> now pension age and your age at home is over because right from birth, you are going to be captured until you exit. And then parliaments, you know, the aspect from parliament pops up. And then we hear suddenly the tens of thousands who are faking around the place. What does that tell you? Well, it tells me in a way that something is going on and something is going on right. The first instance is how did they get to know that there are fake people around or fake um, cards around? It means now we are able to compare with a particular system. So that is very important, even though it's something that has happened, mm. but it tells us that something we are making progress. In my opinion, when I read the news, I was not shocked. Mm. It's supposed to happen. If you already have several of databases and now you are trying to harmonize it, the other one had some information, probably they were not there. So I, I, I mean, I'm okay with it. I think it's normal, but we need to progress further by looking at how do we get those things off. For example, a typical example is when Dr. Bamoa said that um, we are going to have a race rate at bed. It's the foundation mm -hmm. of what we can make sure that we don't have people later on coming to say any other thing. Right. So another thing is how do we get it at bed? Do we get a number just as we are born or we get it at a hospital? These are instances that we must also look at it so that, and those information must feed NIA direct. Right. So he says they, they explain that yeah. you get the number, yeah. but yeah. I think when you turn, is it eight or so, yeah. then you could access the yeah. card. Yeah. Six, yeah. then you could now access yeah. the card. Yeah, it's true. The number, then I, I normally, I'm not, I don't put importance on the card. Mm. I put importance on the number. And now that number is also your TIN. Yes. So that becomes, in fact, when they started talking about the TIN with GRE, I was one of the first guys who said that what they are doing will not work. And I'm happy he mentioned it now. We should push all the money into NIE. Because that is where we can all verify information. When you start to be having those silos, we will always be having those issues. So what it means is that we have a particular database that we can all check our information with. And I think that is what, where we are now. The issue now is how do we move forward from here with some of these issues that we are, I mean, seeing. Then we can... One of the questions you asked is, how do you know that these tens of thousands are actually people who are faking their identity and we don't need them to compromise our systems. We come to you for the answer. You're welcome back. This is Newsfile. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on Newsfile, we put Ghana first. My guest for this segment, Moses Bading, Group CEO, Margins Group. 
this will be the very first uh, public interview on a television that they are doing on the media. Uh, so we thank you so much that you agreed um, when we called you to be here. Dr. Nana Asne is lecturer, School of Technology and Social Sciences, Gimpa. Desmond Israel is lawyer and information um, security data privacy practitioner. Now, a question popped up. All these tens of thousands, hundreds really, that you find are faking the identity around and are harmful to us, getting a clean society. How do you come by that? How are we sure that it's, it is actually the fact that 45,000 people are using driver's license or passports that ought not be in the system? Okay, it's so in the conceptualization and the design of the system. First of all, the system follows the law. Then it follows the best technology. And then the objectives of the design is to harmonize data so that people are who they claim they are. And they exist only once in the database. So you mentioned at birth. Our job is to assess the NIA, which has the mandate, to implement what its acts envisage, Act 750 and Act 995, and to also enforce Allied 2001, Section 7, which Parliament's subsidiary legislation has passed. So that objective in NIA's law is to create a reliable, credible register, accurate register, and to preserve the privacy of this register and the confidentiality. That is the mandate of NIA. Okay, so in designing the data capture system, we put in all the fields that these silo data already collect, because we knew we had to match them. Mm. Then we collect the biometrics, face, fingerprints, and eyes. Then we did duplicate in real time when we're actually in the field, in every village that you saw, we trained about 80,000 people to do this registration cumulatively. Whilst they are doing that in the whole of Ghana, in a single day, we did up to 250,000 registrations. We're comparing in real time this data to the data that already exists in the database and making sure that there are no duplicates and everybody has a unique number. So by the time we're done with the database, we understand that everybody in the NI database exists only once. Mm. As Doctor mentioned, they have a unique number on the register tied to their biometrics. Then we then connected all these silos in real time to the NIA database. After we had received the data and the information that they had presented, every single card, every piece of paper, every proof of identity that you presented at the registration is scanned and attached to your record and can be accessed in real time. So when we connected SNIT, for instance, because SNIT has fingerprints, we run the SNIT database against the NIA database in order to be sure that all the identities in there are secure and they are unique. And that's how you come with a multiple. So you, I take something, your number, I ran against the SNIT database with your fingerprints. And I found that all of a sudden, you something you appear as Moses Baden as well. Mm -hmm. Or that you have two SNIT numbers. So because we run against a unique foundational database, we'll get the duplicates. And then we inform SNIT and NIA, because NIA is actually the mandate holder. They are the mandate holders. We are just technical partners of NIA. So the executive secretary of NIA and the governing board, they make the decisions and say, okay, margins, let's look at this presentation on the data. We work with NIA technical parties and they say, okay, this is against the law. Let's inform SNIT. And SNIT will say, oh, this means our pensioners messed up. People are there with the wrong names. They've changed their names. Mm -hmm. How do we clean up? Then they clean it up. The cleaning up is a legal and policy issue. And rest with the Minister of NIA, which are the, today is Interior, the Executive Secretary of NIA, Professor Tefer, who's doing a fantastic job, by the way, and the Governing Board, which is doing a fantastic job. So they would then direct together with the institution involved. What does the law say? How do we investigate these? What happens? That we're not part of. You know, we, we just keep that. So you take passports, for instance. There's a passport database, but there's no deduplication going on. And these passports, I mean, you don't know whether the passport is fake or because we never, there's no real-time online biometric verification. So today, when you register for a passport, 
the process is that you're supposed to use your Ghana card. Mm -hmm. As soon as we got your Ghana card details, we send it to passport immediately. And we verify against their database. And they return saying that, yeah, we know Moses Bader has this passport number and that passport number. So if it does not exist, we flag it. There are various instances of duplication. One is that some, the passport doesn't exist at all. Mm. So the question is, is this a fake passport? Or is this something to do with the passport's own system? That the, the database is lost or we don't know. We give it to NI and say, hey, Moses Wadden presented this passport when he registered. It doesn't exist. So, passport has not been so now yet. as a result of this process, yes. if you were holding that passport that doesn't exist in the system, mm -hmm. that does not correspond or communicate with your Ghana card, yes. you can use that. So that's a, a policy and legal decision. Mm. So you have to first investigate. I mean, just use my legal background. In my so this view, is the same thing you have done with for uh, every single from for the electoral commission. Everybody and they are talking about how their system is better cleaned up. Everybody, we we found I think in the electoral uh, commission when they registered with the Ghana card in twenty was it seventeen eighteen no twenty nineteen, and then they said we want to check all these Ghana cards with these fingerprints. Who did they belong to? These are their voter's ID number. And then you find out, okay, Samson's using voter ID card one, two, three, four, five, six. But so is doctor. But Samson is the doctor and doctor is in Bogota. How come they have the same national ID number? Are you me? We can compare both the alphanumeric information mm -hmm. that this number appears multiple times. Okay. And that this fingerprint appears multiple times. And that this person who registered as 18 in the national ID database is actually 21 in the voter's ID. Hmm. So this harmonization, and so that, you know, you know, this is the first time I'm doing this on the press because we're there to do the work, not to be in media, but it's become necessary to explain. The question, for instance, of the Buddha's ID, it's not a question of guarantees. It's a question of harmonization. Because if you exist in the silo, I can go and tell EC that I'm 18, maybe I'm 15, but you're not comparing my data to any foundation database in real time. So when it's time to vote, I vote, no matter what guarantee I use. So it is not a guarantee issue. It's a harmonization issue. As Dr. has pointed out, if you harmonize a unique number, foundational, which is biometric, and that has a legal process, even if somebody has gone to steal in the legal process, you'll find out in the okay. end. Okay, I'll go to this one, uh, but I need you to, maybe a question of cost also. Mm. But is it possible that someone could have a Ghana card which is also fake? And what do they do with that? It is not possible to have a genuine Ghana card that's fake. <laughs> <laughs> it is possible to, for instance, theoretically, break into an NI office, steal a Ghana card, take a printer, print some fake information on it, find a laminate or bribe somebody to get a laminate, put it on it, and it will look like a, a Ghana card, but it's fake. Because if we verify it, we'll find out it doesn't exist. If the bank asks you for your card and you give it to them? Because on your Ghana card are your 10 fingerprints okay. and your face. And we can compare live in seconds your live fingerprints to the card. Whether there's a, there's in a completely offline situation where you're not connected to anything. Doctor said he believed in the number not, and not the card per se. Right. But the reason why the card is so important as well as the register is that whether you are online or offline, assuming you don't have a connection, mm -hmm. I can compare your fingerprints to the okay. card in real time. Right. So and we'll find out it's fake. Okay. Right? Okay. O over 80, 85%, you said, of uh, undocumented adult Ghanaians are now registered. At what cost to us? Do I pay for the card? What do I, how do I get it? All successive governments have agreed or come to the conclusion that in order to have everybody included and to have this financial database that will build a clean society, the first card should be free. First card should be free so that everybody rich or poor will have access to a legal identity as a Ghanaian. So the record of their life isn't official so that they can use that identity to access government services commercial services, and financial services, especially in this digital age, digitally, remotely, so that people can get 
services without having to bribe anybody, without the corruption, and this will then. So, so this cost, this cost is what government has decided to bear. In the case of our relationship with NIA, this cost is borne by the private sector. And this is where the misunderstanding is. Government is not financing this. This is being financed by us. Say that again. Government is not the one financing the national ID, at least not the initial financing. We are financing the entire technical system. And NIA is financing the operations. But in this system, we build the system, government test it. If it doesn't work as it is, they don't have to pay. So right from the central systems that Ghana government bought so that they own the data to the cards that's in everybody's pocket is actually pre-financed by us. And we don't get paid if it doesn't work. And our payment formula, respect of whatever ignorance state are. Sorry, you're you are in business that. to make profit. Of course. So how do you make profit? The profit is contracted. It's contractual. You know, we invested up to 169 million initially in the Ghana card project. Now, we get paid on our debts and our equity, guaranteed. And we give government the famous 1.2 billion model so that government can then charge services mm. to different parties. Okay. The money does not come to us. The money is fees and charges passed by parliament. It goes to an escrow agent and government guarantees to pay us our 10% of the debt we've raised and 17% of the equity. That's as simple as that. And, and then that it pays by law. It's in the contract that's available to all parliamentary okay. members. Right. Let, let me get to this one. Uh, yeah. This one is right. Thank you very much for making time to join us from where you are in the U.S. Um, listening to the conversation so far and in the course of the week, reading the revelations and the launch um, of the Ghana card, as it were, uh, for babies. How do you analyze that as a Ghanaian living in a country where you must be familiar with this sort of single source of truth, documentation of citizens? Um, I, think, I think at this point, um, listening to the conversation, one thing that comes to mind is integrity assurance. And uh, we need to give credit to the NIA as a technical partner for doing that job. Because by law, as you've already noted with the background, I mean, by law, um, they are required to ensure these integrity. As in, because they are working with the NIA. The NIA is who owns the data by law. They are what we would call the data controller under our Data Protection Act. So the, the, the technical partner in this case, margins, are the data processes, okay? And so for me, they are doing a good job ensuring that the NIA's mandate in terms of the integrity uh, assurance of the data that is being held is actually in check. Now, back to the fact that we are getting uh, zero age on, on board, it, it adds to the single source of truth. Why? Currently, you're looking at the data that has been identified being like 1% of our population having either unlawful cards, uh, which may have been procured maybe through fraud or uh, through error or maybe through data inconsistency, because it could also be that maybe these silo sovereignty that we, we used to have or we're currently having, which we are trying to face out, may have created this problem that maybe they're moving from one database to the other and somebody's identity could not be moved and therefore there are data inconsistency issues. Now, if you go to age zero, you would, have, you would have guaranteed some sort of identity protection for age zero because the person would have been captured into an existing database and they will grow with that database up to the point that they get issued with the card. Now, I'll tell you why even the issuance of the card is not such a big deal at age zero. What we wanted at law was a national identity register. That is the legal requirement under our law. And then the NIS, which is the National Identification System, developed and, and currently managed by the technical partner, is just the technical manifestation of the requirement at law. So it's pretty much going to a school and saying, I want to see the register of your students here. That's what 
the the technical partner would give us okay this is the nis that is your register mm. so what we actually wanted was to have a unique register of every single person every single citizen every single person that has been captured under the nia nir laws for the purposes of identification and that for me it's it's already on point by the structure that we have now and if we are doing age zero like i've said we've already then we are guaranteeing the the integrity assurance right from birth. But, but how can and you be so how can you be so sure this month you're dealing with a, a third party private entity uh, providing these and you you're still talking about you know integrity and privacy matters people always have concerns about their data and the possibility of it being um, being harvested for other purposes <laughs> okay <laughs> i mean i get where you are going with this but first of all when we set up the legal regime we knew that even from our data protection act not just the nia act we knew that there is definitely going to be the concern of using third parties to process some of these things so by the wisdom of the legislature we we, we already agree that we need to put a third party in there if we don't deal with this third party issue we would we would come to a point where we will not be able to deliver some of these solutions what is important is that the nia is the mandated body that is the body that owns the data that is the body that we can point to mm. concerning you know the technical security of it one thing i can give you for instance the card that is currently being used okay is a cheap base card from a security point of view is the highest you can get when it comes to cards that are less prone to cloning. And these NIA cards currently have, they even have storage on them. I think about 140 kilobytes, I stand correction from the, from, from the expert in the studio, but that and, and, and has what they call applets. Mm. Applets are small, small software that run on it. So yeah, it they say they have 14, 14 applets for data storage, 10 fingerprints, uh, there is also face, there's biometric data, and there is data harmonization all in one card yes all in one card and and so that's that's the assurance that that's actually the technical integrity assurance i want to talk about so even by the design of the technical provider they've given you top of the range i mean if you're talking about security generally there is nothing like a hundred percent security uh, he gave an example there could be physical intrusion into the environment there could be collusion by staff but what is important is technology checks itself so we have built a system currently by, by his presentation so far, both to parliament and from what he's, do, he's speaking about in the studio, we've built a system where we can easily do the validation with the system. We don't need a human validation like we've had with the cyber sovereignty that we've experienced. And that's why you see uh, uh, so many, over 300,000 cards from different agencies being popped up as non-existing cards. It tells you about those systems themselves whether those systems are even able to check themselves because if they're doing their own redundancy duplicacy checks then we will not have so many of these cards out there but to the extent that the nia system has been built such that it could recheck itself then we are giving some assurance that okay we can get a level of integrity from 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 the current system that we are building mm. and because they are using the the chip based with the the, the 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 storage on it, it makes it makes it easier for the harmonization that you are talking about. It's just a matter of time that all these databases would just have to speak to the NIA and then we should be getting value for money. So so what sort of Ghana do you envisage if this is smoothly implemented to the end? To the extent that now we have uh, a, about 85% of undocumented Ghanaians on that single source. What, what kind of Ghana right. do you envisage? So if, 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 you, if you are a bit familiar with the Estonian system, then you are looking at a, the possibility of an EID. Now, the EID would serve as your, your reference to, to driving authorization, your reference to travel, um, um your, your reference to health 
education, um, social, you know, essential uh, services that you can access and the likes. So because, because of where we have started from, trying to build it on a digital platform, mm. try to consolidate it on a chipset card, trying to have everything in a central place, you would end up with an EID and it would be easy. I mean, I've traveled and I, I, I get to airports and some of the European countries, I gave a, I did mention Estonia, all they need to do is pull out their ID. They don't carry passports around. Mm. Just pull out their ID and it's authenticated on this international uh, travel identification system. So that's exactly where we are going. Mm. For the purposes but of the way we are governing ourselves, mm. we can also be looking at a level of transparency, you know, in terms of distribution of resources. Uh, you have an ID, we can pick you up from the NIA system. So it means that if there is electricity to your end, you, the NIA card plus your GPS gives us like a, a unique or, or, or a more like a, a, a a more primary, more solid source of identifying who we have given that, that service to. My, my final question to you will be, um, I don't know how long you have been in our local system. <laughs> um, I suppose you have been in the U.S. for a while. But we have failed at almost every project. What's, what's your, the level of your faith that this will work? so that your country, Ghana, will also mimic, to, to a certain extent, um, what you have in the developed world, where this gives you security, crime rate, and everything else will be checked. Right. So I've spent a greater part of my life in Ghana, so I'm well aware of how things work. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> let, me just say, let me just say with this level of confidence that you started off with a bipartisan parliamentary appreciation of the issue. It doesn't always happen. When you have the, the legislature coming to get to say, we need to support this process, then somebody like me who's almost criticized every bit of technology because I don't see it properly implemented is, is happier because then we have something that we can look up to. Secondly, I, I think that the cost benefit analysis started early. I had um, what 17.8 million, um, you know, being saved because we're trying to put these things together and avoid the silo, the silo base, the silo base uh, uh, identification which we have. So we start with cost, cost benefit analysis. We have parliament buying. I think we also need the executive to be part of that political buying. We don't need to have a switch just because maybe somebody else took power and think that, you know, they want to do something else. All right. For once, we should continue with the consistency. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I definitely see that this, this will turn out well. Okay. Of so, course, it started well, so right. it should turn out well. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Uh, I know it's, uh, it's uh, very late where you are and uh, reaching us. Thank you very much. And in fact, the, we are told that the estimated minimum cost savings uh, is in the region of 1.5 billion US dollars over a period of 15 uh, year duration of the, of the partnership. Now, Nana, you, you are here <laughs> and you are looking at this project and now we've come to a point where you go to bank, you go to everywhere, your ID is being demanded, and some are actually using it outside for certain purposes. And we are told about setting numbers that almost have used it to the equivalence of a passport. Do you trust that if, for example, this government were out, this will be sustained? Because that has been our bane. Before that, let me say something. Um, I have spent much of my time in Finland, which database systems are one of the best in the world. About okay. 20 um, years of my life is there. Okay. And if I see what they are doing now, you see, for a system to move on well, when the sponsors are interested in it, it means it will go on. The sponsors is government. The government. So here you can see almost all the government consistently trying to put resource over there because they know 
that is what will help them somehow to deliver what they are supposed to do. So in my opinion... And are they really that interested when it comes to the question of elections where they would want the opportunity, as we understand, to manipulate the process? And a Ghana card will prevent you from manipulating the process. See, that's the that's advantage of having a technology. With technology, you get to a point you can't do anything. You just have to get into it. Where we are now, there was a time we were not using biometric for voting. But here we are now. So that's where we are going. There is nothing you can do. You just have to get into it and move with it as it is. So in my opinion, with the experience that I have and with a little discussion I've had with them, and whenever I go what is going on, I can see that there is the interest. The only thing is that more resources should be pushed over there. In my opinion, the whole system itself can pay itself back because it's data. Um, in the, when you talk about in Finland, the same institution doesn't take money now from the government mm -hmm. because everybody is picking something from there and they pay something to them. So you understand the module that he yes. spoke about? Yes, okay. everybody picks I, something from I, I was trying to figure no, it out. No, everybody, they, they, don't, they don't... What I know is that we basically are involved in buy and sell issues yeah. here and so they, how do they, you get They don't take back? money from government mm. and you know data. Even if you pick Google, <laughs> you will see that most of the things they are doing, they are doing it for free, but it's not free. That's so right. data is money itself on its own. So with time, it will pay itself and it will, it will be the basis of our development in a way. So for me, I have trust in them mm. that they will do it. Even if government changes, um, they have no choice than to continue okay. where we are now. If the citizens insist, and yes. we must insist. And we must. Okay. And I see that in your school at Gimpa, um, you are advertising, you have advertised this thing you call empowering citizens, yeah. exploring the role of digital identity in socioeconomic development. Mm -hmm. And you're actually hosting Professor uh, Ken Atefa, Executive Secretary of the National Identification Authority, also Professor Samuel E.J. Ampoma, who is Dean, Gimpa School of Technology and uh, Social Sciences, uh, as well as Professor Samuel K. Bonsu, Rector, Ghana Institute of Management and um, Public Administration, Gimpa. Uh, Philippa Sean will be moderating that. This is supposed to be Thursday the 21st at um, 10 a.m. Yeah. Is, it, is it a fee event? No, it's okay. a public lecture. It's so a it's public free. lecture. Yeah. So okay, free. right. Um, where are we, and we have heard, I have hosted Professor Kenatefa speak about Payments that have to be made that consistently are not made and therefore cards are not delivered. Otherwise, for, for instance, going into 2024 elections, we would have easily used the Ghana card to deal away with all the thievery that goes on there. Well, Samson, the, um, you know, this is a very broad topic. I don't think we have enough time to cover all of it. But there's a lot of false information in the media. We are profiteering, the Ghana card belongs to us, we collect money, all that is either malicious or ignorance, right? I like to think it's ignorance. And so there needs to be a proper understanding of how this project is financed. Like I said, we finance everything upfront because it's a PPP. And then government pays us. The advantage for government is No, no, is but I hear good, more good about it than I hear negatives. Yeah, and, that, and, that's true. And, and our guests, Mm. from U.S. and from yes. him from Gimpa. Also. These are much more knowledgeable guests. Okay. <laughs> but everything that we're doing is either in the two acts of NIA, the LI or in the contract. And all these are public documents. So how does it get financed? We designed the central side systems. Government wanted to own the data and the system. They could have owned the data without the system, but they wanted the system. So out of the 18, they acquired the six systems that hold the data. We financed and built the rest of the 12 systems at our own cost. But we use it as a service for government, right? Government took our financial model. That's what the doctor has said Finland does. Mm. And by the way, we are more advanced than Finland and, and Denmark because we do both on the database and on the card side, right? Yeah. So government then took our one, famous 1.2 billion model, which we developed to pay IMS for 10% debt and 70% uh, return on equity, and to pay NIA, and the excess goes to government. So the money doesn't actually belong to us. That escrow and the escrow agent is all money that belongs to a project 
the excess goes to government. It's to pay the whole cost. Now, in order to make it flexible for government to do good policy, which is not basically driven only by commercial considerations, government can decide that we're going to give verification services to radio stations for free for some <laughs> social benefit reasons. Or all rural banks are not paying for verification. When government does that, we don't have any control over that. But our 10% debt and our 17% has to be paid. So in that case, government gives a revenue guarantee, a minimum revenue guarantee. That is when there's a shortfall in the escrow. So government has to pay. Now, because cumulatively, now we have financed something like $300 million, right? And these are for repeatable sources. I mean, we've got five local banks. People have to put security up, factories, buildings, <laughs> directors access to borrow that kind of money, right? The National Fund for Developing Countries, a Danish hold owned fund, which is on our board, has financed multiple millions of that. The French government has financed multiple millions of that. This funding process has been to an international process. You can't borrow that kind of money without going through a proper compliance program. The government owes the money because some services that were rendered to government, just like you're talking about EC, <laughs> ECG, has not been paid. So government has to pay that gap. The inability of government to pay that gap consistently and on time would impact the project because the finance people will pull up their risk mitigation strategies. And that's what happened when the finance minister went to parliament, is that one of the biggest local financiers, Cowbank, which is also the escrow agent, which then gives assurances to all the creditors that we will pay you on time when we receive the money, pull the brakes because they hadn't received the money that we should have paid them which is due to government delays. So there was a guarantee by government that let's agree on a, a payment plan. The revenue will come in, but now that we don't have the revenue, let's agree on the payment plan and we'll pay according to that payment plan. They don't happen as fast as it should. That's what caused the problem. So it's not like we were holding government ransom, uh, you okay. But today, since then, we've had some payments and we've got 17.8 billion. The government still owes money, but I'm informed that they are making efforts to pay mm. what they agreed with Parliament up to at least December 23. Right. How time flies. Thank you very, very much indeed. Moses Bading is Group CEO, Margins Group. Dr. Nana Asne is lecturer, School of Technology and School uh, Social Sciences at Gimpa, Desmond Israel, uh, lawyer and information security data privacy uh, practitioner. Uh, he joined us from the US. I'm Samson Ladia Yenini. Uh, thank you all very much. Have a good afternoon. This has been Newsfile. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform.